Welcome back to ESC 418. This is lecture 4b and today we'll be talking about how to use transitional phrases to maintain coherence within a document, mainly within a paragraph but also between or among paragraphs. So let's see what is the difference between paragraph coherence and transitional phrases. Well coherence is the overall effect or the overall structure that we're looking for. Transitional phrases are a tool or a type of word that we will use to achieve that. So coherence includes transitional phrases and parallel structure and a number of other topics that we'll be talking about soon. But today in this lecture, we're just talking about transitional phrases. So first, let's start with coherence. So coherence includes sentence structure that makes a paragraph stick together. It includes transitions from one sentence to the next. We can use these transitions to draw logical connections between each sentence and we want to use similar types of word construction whether we're talking about transitional phrases or parallel construction or any other part of coherence we want it to be similar it's much easier for a reader to follow that way and so the specific device that we're talking about today is the transitional phrase so what can these do so it can provide coherence most importantly it can bridge one thought with the next and we'll see a, a lot of different examples about how to do this in different circumstances where we would use a different type of transitional phrase. So we can show logical progressions in our thought and help hopefully persuade our reader to follow the same logic. And we can give our reader cues about where we're going next. There are a lot of different ways we can categorize transitional phrases and I'll go through a number of different phrases. But I just want to mention that in the links that I've provided in the lecture notes, you'll see that the online writing laboratory, the textbooks, and other sources tend to have slightly different categorizations. There is no absolute definition of any of these categories. And each of our sources has a slightly different list of words. I've sort of tried to pick the ones that are most common in technical writing and the ones that will probably be the most useful to you. The first six or seven categories I will go through in detail after these slides. So I'm going to go through them fairly quickly and then we'll step through giving examples of each of them. So important transitional phrases and you'll see in writing each of the bullet points here are typically words that you'll see followed by a comma followed by a second phrase that links the second sentence to the first sentence. So the first set are transitional phrases that add information. So also in addition, moreover, furthermore, and finally. Each of these have slightly different meanings and slightly different uses. And that's the same with almost all of the transitional phrases in these lists. Transitional phrases that contrast ideas. So we're showing differences between the second idea compared to the first idea. So however, nevertheless, conversely, in contrast, on the other hand, and notwithstanding. And again, each of these has a very slightly different meaning although some of them can be used interchangeably. And then sometimes we want to compare ideas. So these are comparable or similar ideas where we want to show a similarity from one sentence to the next. So similarly, likewise, compared to, and whereas. Although whereas can be more of a contrasting word actually, but it can be a comparison word. Sometimes we want to show examples. So we'll start with a general phrase and we'll make a statement about some fact and then we'll want to give specifics and this is extremely common in technical writing because what we want to do is we want to give our reader a general concept and help explain something to them but we need to back it up with data and evidence and examples and concrete information so almost everything in this list is designed specifically to introduce a more specific list or a more concrete list than what we've just discussed we also look at cause and effect a lot in scientific writing. So we will make some statement and we'll say therefore, and then we'll describe something that is a result of that first statement that we've made. So consequently, accordingly, as a result, in conclusion, these are all slightly different words or phrases that we'll use to combine one thought into a cause and effect result that we're going to explain. And often we'll need to summarize things. So we might need to do this at the end of a report. We might need to do this part way through. It's actually quite useful to summarize at the end of every section after we've given a, a lot of data. We might want to give a short summary to our reader to help them just lock in that concept, which we can then come back to 
We may also want this though at the end of our document as well if we have an actual summary section. It really helps the reader to retain those big picture ideas. The next set of transitional phrases are used to elaborate on a topic that we might have just discussed. And this means we can extend our thoughts through time, through space. We can extend a concept from simple data to a bigger picture item. And so we will use words like by extension and ultimately. We can also elaborate by just giving more detail or restating something. And in that case, we might say in other words, or that is to say, in which case we might completely restate something we've just said in different words to help somebody understand the meaning in a different way. And the next list is all about expressing likelihood. Now I'm going to leave this list until next week because we're actually going to be talking about these words in a different context. Because when we're doing scientific writing, we need to be very precise in our language when we're talking about likelihoods, possibilities, potential occurrences, predicted occurrences. These all have really specific meanings in scientific writing. So I'm going to leave these. I just want you to be aware that these are also transitional phrases. Although next week we're going to be talking more in terms of how we communicate likelihoods and probabilities to non-scientists. There are three lists here that are fairly common in everyday language, so I won't go through them in a lot of detail. I will just say that they're fairly useful in scientific writing. We want to use them to bridge thoughts if we're talking about something that's happening in time, especially if we're listing some steps that have been taken. We might say first this happened, second that happened, but we can also use logical lines of evidence in that same sort of construction. We can say our first line of evidence is our second is, our third is. So these are good transitional phrases. We might also want to indicate places. So if we're discussing something that's happening in one place, we might say nearby, the same thing is happening, or in the background, something else is happening. So these are nice transitional phrases. But as I mentioned, they're fairly common to us, so we don't really need to go through them with technical examples. And then the last example here is when we concede something. This is not very common in technical language, although it does uh, come into play sometimes. So we would start a sentence with of course. In other words, certainly, granted, naturally. So certainly this could be the case. Naturally, we would expect this to happen. Again, these are fairly commonly used outside of technical language. So I'm going to focus on the ones that we've seen this far. And with that, let's get into some detail. All right, let's look at these in more detail, starting with transitional phrases that we would use to add information. So in this case, we're generally going to be adding information that is similar to the first piece of information that we've added. So in this example, the first two are actually fairly similar. Also and in addition are usually used for adding similar information to each other. So the first example is the weather was too cold for sampling on that date. Also, the sampling equipment had been destroyed. So in this case, we're showing two similar reasons why we could not collect samples. They both had related causes and effects. Second, the river valley had been carved over millions of years. In addition, spring floods had moved the bed materials downstream. So in this case, these are two fairly similar things. One is long periods of a river valley being carved, and the second is periodic movement of the material, which is also carving the valley. So these are very similar. Also, in addition, they're probably interchangeable most of the time. The next one's a little bit different though. We would use moreover usually for expressing some idea that is in addition to the first one, but it's usually something that's a slightly different concept and usually it's a more important concept. So usually we'll give one fact and then we'll say moreover and then we'll introduce the second loosely related but probably more important fact. The samples could not be collected because of budget constraints. Moreover, the health and safety plan had not been considered. So now we're, we're giving a few reasons that uh, we're having problems with our sampling study. The first is that we couldn't collect samples, but we're saying even though that's a problem, probably the bigger problem is that we hadn't considered health and safety. The next one is furthermore. So furthermore is usually we're going to use that when we're drawing some sort of conclusion and emphasizing a second point which we're also adding information. So samples should be collected to confirm the presence of silicates. Furthermore, the conceptual model should be ver verified periodically. So in other words, the first piece of information we're saying is that you need to go out and collect samples. 
Furthermore, though, is introducing more of a big picture concept. It's more important and it's additional to the first one. So we would say furthermore to let the reader know that there's something important coming. The last one is we're adding some information and it's the last piece of information we'll add. And this can be just something that is um, added on at the end. It fits the list, but it's just the last one in line. Or it can also be the most important thing. And so you'll see finally shows up in a few of these different lists. It shows up in the conclusions list, in the time list, and in the adding information list. So it can be any or all of these things all at once. So all of these steps should be taken before proceeding to full-scale trials. Finally, the economic viability of the project should also be considered. So this is a nice concluding statement that adds to the first sentence. The next list is transitional phrases that contrast ideas. These are really important in scientific writing because often we will want to use contrast to highlight some difference and to show something that we've learned or something that the data show. So the weather was too cold for sampling on that day. However, it was not too cold to take photographs. So this is a nice transition. Even though we couldn't set out to do everything we wanted, we were able to do something and there, therefore we'll use however to contrast what we couldn't do with what we could do. The river valley had been carved over millions of years. Nevertheless, the granite river bed remained unchanged. So nevertheless is used when we've just made a statement and we want to show some contrast and the second statement is something that might be surprising given the context of the first sentence. So in other words, the river valley had been carved over millions of years. This might lead us to believe that the riverbed had been carved as well. However, in this case, the riverbed is made of granite, so it remained unchanged. So nevertheless, really highlights that this is going to go against our expectations. The next one is a little bit similar. So notwithstanding usually means that we are going to disregard what we just said, or we are going to show some exception to the rule or that type of contrast. The samples could not be collected because of budget constraints. Notwithstanding, the health and safety plan must still be written. So in other words, even though we're out of budget, we still need to do that health and safety plan. It doesn't rely on the budget. The next one, I actually like this word a lot, conversely. Samples confirm the presence of silicates. Conversely, the conceptual model suggests that silicates would be leached away. So conversely draws us to something that's really unexpected. A good example here, it goes against our conceptual model. So it's really drawing that contrast between what we find versus what we expect and this should trigger some thinking on the part of the reader. These next steps are normally taken before proceeding to full-scale trials. In contrast, a more expedient path would be to skip the bench scale tests. So in this case, we're using in contrast to show that there's an alternate path we could be taking, there's an alternate way of thinking about this, and this, again, draws contrast from our first sentence. The next category is very similar, except now we're dealing mostly with ideas that are similar. The weather was too cold for sampling on that day. Similarly, it was too cold this time last year. So we're alerting the reader to the fact that we're about to give them some similar information so that they can compare and contrast. The river valley had been carved over millions of years. Likewise, the sedimentary riverbed had been carved down the middle. So these are similar. They're not identical, but we're giving them similar information and this just helps to link the concepts in the reader's mind. The samples could not be collected because of budget constraints. Compared to the health and safety plan, the samples are not as important. So in this case, we're comparing this, although they're not similar, we're actually showing, we're using the comparison to show how they're different. Whereas previous studies found predominantly carbonate material, our samples confirmed an abundance of silicates. So in this example, we're using this comparison to highlight the fact that we found something new. This next list is transitional phrases that will introduce examples. And these are fairly self-explanatory. Most of them sound exactly like what they mean. So when we use for example, we are going to list examples, one or more examples. So the weather station was too cold for sampling on that day. For example, the calibration solutions were frozen solid. That is one example of why it was too cold. We might list several examples. The next is when we're going to give some specific information moving from the general to the specific, so we use specifically. The river valley had been carved over millions of years. Specifically, it moved from an elevation of 342 meters during the Cretaceous period 
to its present day elevation of 295 meters. The next is when we're giving specific examples and in the second of the examples I've given in the third paragraph, we are actually going to illustrate or show something. So samples confirm the presence of silicates. For instance, X-ray diffraction identified an abundance of quartz. To illustrate the difference between quartz and feldspar, we've provided a generic scan of each mineral. And in the last one, we're actually going to name some examples, one or more example. Samples confirm the presence of silicates. Namely, we identified quartz, feldspar, and olivine. I'll just say one last thing about this list. These are used a lot. They're very helpful. They're very good in technical writing because we often want to introduce something general, but then back it up with specific information. The last thing I'll say about these is for example and for instance are fairly interchangeable. Each of the other ones are fairly specific as to when you would want to use it. The next list is also very important in scientific writing when we want to show cause and effect. So the weather was too cold for sampling on that day. Accordingly, the sampling equipment was left in a warm place until the next day. We'll often use the word accordingly to show why we did something or why some action was taken. So one event happened and accordingly we did something else. The river valley had been carved over millions of years. Therefore, the riverbed is lower than it was during the Cretaceous period. So this is showing a cause and effect. The river valley was carved away and therefore the river is now lower. The samples could not be collected because of budget constraints. Consequently, the study results had high uncertainty. So the study results were a consequent of the lack of, of sample data. We could also use therefore in this instance a lot of these are interchangeable. Accordingly is really the one that relies more on some action that's been taken as a result of something else. Whereas therefore and consequently are just showing some consequence or some result. Samples should be collected to confirm the presence of silicates. Hence, we recommend initiating a field study. We'll often use the word hence to show some logical connection or some conclusion. All of these steps should be taken before proceeding to full-scale trials. In conclusion, we have provided a plan to execute these steps. And so in conclusion is used really in two ways. One is to draw some logical conclusion, but it can also be used to draw an end or a conclusion in that sense. This next list is important because in science and in technical writing, we often want to elaborate on something and we can elaborate in terms of drawing conclusions, extrapolating, giving more information, and trying to infer something from what we've learned. We have to be very careful here though not to over uh, elaborate or we fall into the realm of speculation and we can extrapolate too far and go beyond what our data are actually telling us. So we have to be careful. These should actually be trigger words for us to really think about do we really know what we're about to write down. So the weather was too cold for sampling on that day. Ultimately, the study had to be abandoned. So this is just linking the fact that the cold weather led to the entire abandonment of the study, which is a much bigger problem than simply having cold weather. The river valley had been carved over millions of years. By extension, we can infer that the river had eroded most of that material. And so when we use by extension here, we're actually drawing some conclusion that goes beyond what we know specifically, and we're using what we know about general scientific uh, behaviors to draw that conclusion. We're using the word by extension to show that we are extending our knowledge to go beyond what we know specifically and what we know factually to something that we are inferring or we are speculating or we're trying to make some interpretation of the data. Samples should be collected to confirm the presence of silicates. That is to say, we need to sample material and analyze its mineralogy. So in this case, we're elaborating by completely restating in more general terms to help the person understand what we meant by the first sentence. All of these steps should be taken before proceeding to full-scale trials. In other words, we need to proceed with caution. And so these last two sentences, the last two transitional phrases, are fairly similar. We're restating using entirely different language, saying something even more generally or more specifically, but really just restating it to help the reader understand what we're saying. Lastly, let's look at some transitional phrases that we would use to summarize. And we might want to summarize partway through our document just to keep things shorter, or we might want to summarize at the end to wrap things up to remind our reader what we've been writing about 
and to emphasize some key facts. The weather was too cold for sampling on that day and we could not access the site on other days. In summary, we have no data to support the conclusions. So in this case, we're summarizing what we've just said and drawing a transition between having not been able to sample the data and not being able to draw conclusions from that. We have presented multiple lines of evidence, including fossil records, sediment cores, and stratigraphic sequencing. In conclusion, the data indicate that the river valley had been carved over millions of years. So here we're being explicit about the data we're using to draw a conclusion, and we're helping the reader understand exactly how we came to that conclusion. The samples could not be collected because of budget constraints. In short, we spent all the budget on planning. So in this case, we're using in short just to summarize, in other words, shorten, not to wrap up, but really just to shorten a big explanation. We don't need a big long-winded explanation about this. We spent all the budget. So in short, we spent it. Samples should be collected to confirm the presence of silicates. In brief, this study would entail field sampling, laboratory analyses, and interpretation. So when we say in brief, what we're saying is we're only going to provide a little bit of information here, but be aware that there is a lot more information behind this that you might need to know. All of these steps should be taken before proceeding to full-scale trials. In conclusion, we have provided a plan to execute these steps. So in this case, in conclusion means we are wrapping this up and here's our last piece of information for you. It's a plan to execute these steps. So we've been through all of the transitional phrases that we'll go through. Please go through the reading lists that I've provided because there are other ones that you should know. And it is good to see them presented slightly differently. In conclusion, I would just like to go over however and therefore because these are often misused and they're often misused as comma splice sentences. So I've shown one of each in red. The sample was contaminated, therefore it was discarded. I would say I see this much more commonly than I see it written correctly. So this is incorrect. You'll remember from our comma splice discussion. The correct way of putting this would be to use a semicolon or a period. In either one is fine. The sample was contaminated. Therefore, it was discarded. We see the same type of construction with however all the time. The rock was exposed to rain. However, the rock was inert. So really we have two independent clauses here that should be separated by a semicolon or a period. So be careful with those two. All right, so try out the examples in the materials that I've linked to because these are really important to use. They'll help your writing be much more readable than if you're not using them. And I would suggest that almost every paragraph you write would have one or two of these in it. I tend to find my writing uses them on probably more than 50% of sentences in the long document because it really helps move the reader from start to finish. Another thing that I see a little bit too often is people will latch on to five or six of these and use them repeatedly throughout. And that's why I went through this in details because I want you to see that there are nuances. So there are some that you would use in certain circumstances versus others. And it's really important to get them right because it really helps your reader transition and bridge these sentences and if you're just using the same one over and over again, not only can it be wrong, but it can be a little bit repetitive and not that fun to read. So practice with these and we'll see you in the next lecture.